All right, good, uh, good evening everybody. It is six o'clock, and I will call the ninth regular Common Council meeting to order. Will the clerk state the quote of the evening? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. The ability to learn is the most important quality a leader can have. Thank you, will the clerk call the roll? Alderperson Bellinger. Here. Alderperson Decker. Here. Alderperson Feldy. Here. Alderperson Heideman. Here. Alderperson Lefebvre. Here. Alderperson Mitchell. Is he online? Uh, excused for now? Alderperson Perella. Here. Alderperson Peterson. Here. Alderperson Ramey. Here. Alderperson Rust. Present. There are nine present. Thank you. If folks could please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Um, Alder Decker, is there a motion for the minutes from our Thank last meeting? Thank you, Mayor. I move to approve the minutes from the 8th regular council meeting held on July 15th, 2024. Thank you. Oh, excuse me. Is there a second? Second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion on the minutes? Seeing none, all those in favor of approval of the minutes state aye. Aye. Any objections? Minutes are approved. Next, appointments, city attorney. The uh, mayor submits the following appointments for your confirmation, John Beaudry and Minami Beaudry to be considered for appointment to the mayor's international committee. Thank you, Elder Decker. Thank you, Mayor. I move to confirm. Second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, this is a roll call vote. Nine eyes. That's approved. All right. Next public forum, city clerk. The first person tonight is Dave Rapinski. Thank you. Would Mr. Rapinski, please come up. And then Dave, if you could state your name and address, and then you'll have five minutes. And then just, just the mic. There we go. My name is Dave Rapinski. Is, do I just get just me, or can I have one just, other person just talk you. at all? Just, just me. You. Yep. Well, I guess everything that needed to be said has already been said, and I want to thank everybody that is here and listened, especially some of you, all the persons really, Karazi especially, thank you very much. I mean, I, I talked to everybody, and the mayor, thank you very much. And I just want to thank everybody else. I want to thank my father for showing up and um, my employees and a lot of other, a few other bar owners and a lot of other people, and I got to say, it just makes me feel good. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Scott Hansen. Scott, I saw you. All right. Here. And then Scott, if you could say your name and address, and then the item you're speaking on. Yes. My name is Scott Hansen, and first I'll ask is, can everybody hear me? And if you can't, please let me know. No. Uh, no. You cannot hear? No. Thank you. Can you hear now? Okay. That, 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 oh, thank you. Okay, my name is Scott Hansen. I live at 611 Alabama Avenue in Sheboygan. I have lived in Sheboygan since 1982 and enjoy our wonderful city and the Lake Michigan shoreline. I previously owned a local business, Cardinal Environmental. We were an environmental laboratory and worked with the city of Sheboygan on many environmental issues. For approximately 15 to 20 years, one of our tasks was to, take, to sample the Lake Michigan beaches and stormwater outfalls in Sheboygan and adjacent counties. We tested the beach water for E. coli bacteria to confirm that the water was safe for swimming. In the past, I was also a board member on the King Park Neighborhood Association for a few years. Point number one, the King Park Neighborhood Association did not endorse the construction 
of the 215 unit Malibu apartments for a number of reasons. I bring up only these three issues of concern. Number one, a sanitary sewer concern. If built, the sewage from 215 apartments will discharge to 7th Street, then north to the municipal pump station at Kentucky Avenue and South 7th Street. For those of you do, who do not know where this Malibu Apartments is to go, it's at the former Optenberg site. It's currently called the Kite Beach site. From the Kentucky Avenue South 7th Street, it will be pumped toward Lake Michigan along the alley adjacent to Jail Dicote. At the beginning of the sand beach, a 60 inch concrete pipe runs south along the beach near the current grassy zone, past Kite Beach, King Park Beach, and along the bluff near the gra along the bluffs all the way to the Sheboygan Wastewater Treatment Plant. This 60 inch concrete pipe and the municipal station were constructed in 1936. Three points regarding the sanitary line that needs to be considered and addressed. One, three to five years ago, we were informed that this sanitary line was in grave danger, specifically in the area of the bluffs because of the substantial lakeshore erosion, erosion and the fact that it was suspended above, above ground in, more, in one or more areas at the bottom of the bluff. It was stated that the breach their breach or failure would be catastrophic. As of today, there's been no documented effort to support, shore, or secure the sanitary line from further damage. The only acknowledgement is to tell the Sheboygan taxpayers that the city is waiting for a grant from FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency. I imagine we are way down the list with FEMA as they primarily respond to crisis issues about, that, uh, that, can, that occur. There may be a plan to install a fiberglass liner in the 60 inch cement pipe, but the timing of this effort is not firm. In addition, the water level at historical low levels gives access to the bluff areas needing repair or shoring, and this may, never, this may not be accessible in the future. When and if the water rises, the continual erosion, the continual erosion in the bluff areas where the sanitary line is exposed is very likely. Number two. The contribution of sewage from essentially an additional 200 to 500 individuals may cause the sanitary lines from the residential homes, for the residential homes along Georgia Avenue, Alabama Avenue, the alleys, and 7th Street to be inundated with more sewage than the system can handle. These are the homes between the proposed Malibu apartments and the Kentucky Avenue Municipal Pump Station. Three, if the Malibu apartments are constructed, the east wall will be very close to the 60-inch sanitary concrete pipe that flows north and south along the grassy area adjacent to the beach. The use of heavy equipment, heavy construction equipment, and the effort to drive the pilings to a depth to support a five-story structure could potentially crush or in some other way damage the 60-inch concrete pipe if appropriate cautions are not considered. Number two, stormwater. There's a stormwater outfall on the east end of Clara Avenue. The outfall has required sewer jetting to remove sand and debris over several occasions. The Clara Avenue water outfall allows, stormwater outfall allows a pooling of stormwater with historical elevated E. coli bacteria. E. coli is the bacteria which identifies that a swimming beach should be designated closed or signed as elevated warning due to health concerns for people in contact with the water or the wet sand young children in the sand. When an event occurs, occurs, when a storm event occurs, the pooled or stored water is flushed into the Lake Michigan. The discharge from this outfall has contributed to the closing of Kite Beach and King Park Beach several times over the past decades. Currently, the former Optenberg property, Kite Beach, is a permeable green space. Scott, I just want to wrap it up. Okay, when, this, when and if this structure occurs, this space will be impermeable. These hard services will likely direct all the storm water to the Clara Avenue storm discharge. The third thing has to do with winter parking. Uh, the parking of vehicles on boulevards, cul-de-sacs, and 7th Street are no longer allowed in the, during storm events. Thank you. City Clerk. Warren Waddell. <clears throat> And then Warren, if you could state your name, address, and then the item you're speaking on. And then just adjust the mic. Yes. 
I'm Warren Waddell. My address is 3306 North 8th Street in Sheboygan. I'm here tonight to address the issue of the uptown parklet becoming a permanent fixture for the downtown area. Uh, this has been a project for the last uh, couple of years. It has been a temporary uh, fixture for the summertime where St. Clair Avenue has been closed to allow for uh, benches and other park areas, things to be put into on the street. And uh, it has been resolved and uh, a, a resolution is being presented to the Common Council to refer it to the Public Works to make this a permanent structure. Uh, there is quite a bit of concern on my part and on a number of people's parts. First of all, this is going to be an all-year structure that is going to permanently close St. Clair Avenue uh, between 8th and 9th Streets. And I am the pastor at Fountain Park Global Methodist Church, which is adjoining on St. Clair Avenue. And that would limit a, a large amount of traffic. There is regular traffic that goes through there all year. And when that street is closed off, the traffic is hindered. It has to be taken in a variety of other routes. Our parking lot happens to come right off of St. Clair Avenue. Secondly, uh, this being an all-year all proposal, we're looking at closing the street for about four months of use. If you're going to be making a parklet in the city of Sheboygan uh, and you're going to be using it for four months, we live in Wisconsin where there are practically seven months of winter and I'm not sure the Common Council has considered what the snow removal and things would do around there. In the proposal, it says that local businesses were contacted and were also very highly supportive of this uh, parklet. The church has never been contacted with regard to approval or not of that parklet. There is only one business currently that is being patronized by this parklet. The Ale House on the south side of 8th Street has closed. The only business now using that, uh, that area is the Paradigm Restaurant. There are other businesses in Sheboygan that have had the possibility of having a parklet in front of them and they have used the sidewalk areas for benches and tables for their patrons. If we're going to close 8th Street for one business, I think that's very unfair to the rest of the businesses in Sheboygan. Also, the parklet is located one block from Fountain Park. It's very unreasonable to have a parklet just one block from a city park. It really does not make much sense to close a street and make it into a permanent parklet one block from a city park. Also, in the proposals coming before you that will be referred to the Public uh, the Works Committee, there is a proposal for $379,000 being used to design this parklet into a permanent structure. I am wondering whether that is a wise use of city taxpayer monies. There are a number of other areas where these monies could be used to impact the total population of Sheboygan. Also, I question the purpose of having a permanent parklet when it is very rarely used. Being close to that parklet, I noticed that the parklet is used for only a few people, only a few days of the week. If we entitle those, that area to be a permanent parklet, it's not a very good use of city park or city areas, especially if we're closing a street. I came by tonight and there was one person sitting in the parklet, which if the sidewalk were to be developed on both sides of the street, it could easily accommodate all of the people that are seeming to use that area. Thank you. Thank you. City Clerk. 
Andrew Bowman. Then, Andrew, if you could state your name, address, and then the uh, item. Andrew Bowman. I live on 2228 Lakeshore Drive. And uh, good evening, members of the Common Council and Mayor Sorson. Uh, I currently live on Lakeshore Drive, and I'm here to just talk about concerns I have with the current Malibu apartment development plan. Uh, and my concerns are based on the plans that have been submitted and are for public viewing. Uh, I grew up near the beach as a kid, known as Kite Beach, and have been kite surfing and surfing in Sheboygan since 2003. So this is a neighborhood and a community outdoor space that I have deep ties to and know very well. I can confidently say that the size, the location, and the scope of the project currently does fit within the neighborhood or the natural confines of the beach and of the lake. Uh, the building, we met with the developers today on the site and had a very uh, nice and cordial meeting about some of the realities. And they, I think, once they saw things through our lens, were surprised by some of the concerns that I'll state here. And uh, again, I'm basing my concerns off of the plans that are currently in place. Uh, the building is located literally mere yards from the beach. Uh, and it's based off of 75 foot ordinary high water setback, which in the plans is actually underwater. The building will be based 130 feet back from that ordinary high water mark. But historically speaking, not long ago from 2016 to 2020, the water was up to the field there at Kite Beach. Uh, also, the ordinary high water mark does not take into account storm serve and wave action. I encourage you guys to all come down to the beach tomorrow. We got a real freight train of a forecast coming and you will see half the beach underwater. So during these same types of weather events, the beach would be, the water actually goes into the field. Uh, one area of great concern for us is the city plan cul-de-sacs at the end of Georgia and Clara Avenue. They currently, in the design, go well beyond the roads. The one at Clara, we measured it out today, would extend into, today I took a tape measure, from where the Clara, based off the plans to scale, based off of Clara, and at 75 feet from the high water mark, I was actually, my ankles were in the water, and the one on the end of Georgia will go through a dune and then actually sit roughly 20 yards on the beach. Both the closeness of the apartments and the cul-de-sacs will require extensive revampment work, uh, including you know, rocks and erosion control that's needed. The project's large size also does not include enough parking. There's 141 spots underneath the building and there's 72 outside. There's 157 units, 70 of them are two or three bedroom. And then we add a commercial space of 3,700 square feet for a restaurant. Based on the fact that 60% of a restaurant is used for the dining room, that comes out to an industry average of 15 square feet per chair. That, that's a 150 seat restaurant that they're planning. You include staff and parking amounts, that's an additional 75 parking spots that will be needed just for that commercial space. That's not included in the plans. City parking on the streets is not uh, gonna work because paper box employees and multiple semis park there as they wait to load and unload. Uh, so the parking and the developers today were, uh, clearly saw some of the issues with parking that we talked about. I also just want to talk about the important role that that beach plays within the community. Uh, Kite Beach is a beautiful undeveloped spot and we want to make sure that beach is not covered in stonework and ramparts. When the water comes up and it, when it's hitting stone, it does not, the beach does not fill back as easily and you can see that at High Avenue and all along the uh, cliffs of the South Side Bluff. So if we have to put a bunch of stonework in to protect the cul-de-sacs that extend far out past the project and to protect the apartment, uh, we're gonna have problems with the beach coming back in. 
Sheboygan is extremely lucky to have the economic growth that it's seen right now. And change is not a bad thing when done right, and there are multiple elements of this project that are not done right. None of us are saying we should not develop Kite Beach, but we are saying we can't, we should sit back and look at the current plan, make some revisions to it. So I encourage you to vote no on the, the plan tonight until we have some information that addresses the needs we have. Thank you. Thank you. All right, city clerk. The last person tonight is Jim Van Akron. And then Jim, if you could introduce your name, address, and the items you're speaking on. Uh, my name is Jim Van Akron. Uh, I live at 432 Lincoln Avenue in Sheboygan, and I'm speaking on item number 30, the Malibu Apartments. Uh, as many of you know, I chair the city's sustainability task force, but my comments this evening are my own and don't represent the task force. First, I wish to raise a procedural concern. Item 30 on tonight's agenda states, uh, resolution number 482425 by Alder Persons Bellinger and Perella approving the general development plan, and I emphasize general development plan, submitted by Malibu Apartments LLC for construction of Malibu Apartments on a parcel with a planned unit development zone. The notice for the public hearing also indicates that it is for the general development plan. The first paragraph of the actual resolution states, a resolution approving the general development plan submitted by Malibu Apartments LLC for construction of Malibu Apartments on parcel with a planned unit development zone. If you're persistent enough, you see within the resolution that there is mention of the specific implementation plan. A specific implementation plan is different from a general development plan. Uh, and a conclusion to approve the, and it also asks that you approve the general development plan and the specific implementation plan. This is significant because the specific implementation plan allows the developer to proceed with phase one of their project, the building on the south side of the site. When the agenda does not give notice of approval of the specific implementation plan, and the first pass paragraph of the resolution also does not, it appears the city has failed to give adequate notice to the public for approval of the specific implementation plan. Now you may say I'm splitting hairs, but the plan commission agenda recognized that these were two different approvals. Each was listed separately on the July 9th plan commission agenda. Your attorney can give you advice as to whether this is legally problematic. My point is this is not what democracy looks like. Approving a concept, the general development plan, is a world different from giving it the go-ahead to build, which is what the specific implementation plan does. The public should be able to look at an agenda and understand what may be discussed or approved. This agenda does not. I sent you all an email outlining, you, outlining my objections to approving this project. I hope you have done your civic duty and review the email. I won't repeat all my points. I want to make absolutely clear I do not oppose residential development on this site. Even with a higher density than is present in the neighborhood, there are many benefits to the city by building a higher density residential area. I recognize the need for apartments as indicated in the recent housing study. This project is just too big and too tall for this site. This isn't a matter of not in my backyard. Most of us in opposition to this plan recognize the need for development. It's a matter of scale. If the goal is to get as many units as possible, then the Memorial Hospital site is better suited to do this. It is a larger site. It historically had a five-story building in the neighborhood. I am not advocating this. I think uh, what is developed at Memorial site should be sensitive to the nature of the housing in the area. Greater density than the, than the neighborhood is presently, but the building at a scale that fits into the neighborhood, just like what should happen at the Kite Beach site. 
I hope you've had an opportunity to review the shoreline resolution plan that the city authorized in 2022, or shoreline rest restoration plan. That's this copy. I'm, I made a reference in my email to you. You could have uh, gone to the DPW site to look at it. What struck me tonight as I walked in was here's a nice view of Visit Sheboygan. There's copies over there. And you look at the Blue Harbor site and the rocks are right up against the property that belongs to the city. That's all city property there. If you look at the shoreline restoration management plan, it's the exact same view, except it shows how the rocks have sunk, how the bluff has eroded away, and this was just a matter of a couple of years ago. This is what's going to happen to the Malibu site if you approve the plan as presented to you. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. All right, that concludes public forum. Next, we'll move on to the finance director's 2024 year-to-date budget report and 2025 budget outlook by the finance director. Caitlin. Bear with me momentarily. All right. Good evening, everyone. As the mayor mentioned, my name is Caitlin Krieger. I am the finance director here at the city of Sheboygan. And as part of the budget schedule uh, that is presented every June or July, uh, a second uh, a meeting is held where we go through the 2024 uh, year to date budget. Um, so tonight we're looking at the budget to date and what we are looking at for 2025's budget as we move forward. Today we will be focusing on the general fund of the budget. What that means is it's the general functions of the city. This includes fire, police, public works, finance, administration. It's most of the general functions of the city and are encapsulated in one large fund called the general fund. To date, uh, we have revenues and expenses, and I do apologize, it is a bit small on the screen. I'm happy to send this out to anybody who is interested. Uh, but to date, we are at about 43.87% of revenues. This is as of June 30th, I will mention. Uh, and as of June 30th, we are at 45.95% of expenditures. Some key items that I wanna point out when we look at the budget to date is that there are four large payments that we receive in uh, bulk throughout the year. Uh, we have the August tax settlement that we have not received yet, so that will be uh, almost $5 million that we will, re will receive in a few weeks. We also will be receiving the state shared revenue dollars from the state, that is about $13.5 million, so we have not received that yet. And additionally, we have a 1.5 in transportation aid and the water utility payment in lieu of tax uh, that we have not received yet. If we do incorporate those figures into the amounts that we know that we have received already through the year, we are actually going to be at about 92% of the budget. So some of the items that we get uh, revenue from, including ambulance billing, uh, we have park rentals, things like that, we collect throughout the, the rest of the year. So that is what's gonna make up that other 8% as long as we keep up with where we are moving forward uh, through budget time. Additionally, on the expenditure side, I want to point out that we do an annual transfer for both motor vehicle and IT service fund charges. These are internal funds where we pay the motor vehicle and pay the IT departments to do the business for the rest of the city. So for that, we had already did an annual transfer of approximately $3 million. 
If we were to subtract half of that annual transfer to see where we are as of to date, we are at just about 21.1 million or 46.68% of the budget for 24. So we are on pace for halfway through the year. When we look at the uh, specific lines in the general fund for revenue, we are looking pretty uh, solid in all of the categories. We're at about 50% or even a little bit above for certain lines. The uh, taxes and intergovernmental revenue, those are the two lines that will be most heavily impacted by the uh, large settlements that we have coming later this year. So those state shared revenues and the taxes that will be getting settled uh, shortly. On the expense side, we are uh, doing uh, fairly well on track uh, for 2024's budget. We are at about 45.9%. Uh, there is a slight lag. Uh, if you look at the salaries line, we're at 40.8% as at the six month mark. We actually are uh, paying, we have a lag in our payroll, so that will actually catch up uh, in July and we pull back some of January's expenses to December. So that number always does lag. However, the benefit side is pretty much right on track. As you can see, we're at 49.3%. That matches uh, where we would be for the year uh, at the six month mark. A lot of the uh, purchase services are contracts that we pay uh, lump sums throughout the year for a year's worth of service. So that always is a little bit ahead uh, typically from where we would expect for budget. When we look at 2025's budget outlook, there are quite a few things that uh, the city has to consider when we go through the budget planning process. One of those being the levy limit. This is a requirement by the state of Wisconsin that puts uh, the change of our equalized value is the consideration for what we need to, or are allowed to, I should say, a levy increase um, each year. So we don't have that figure yet. We should be getting it about August 15th. We do have preliminary numbers which we're using to uh, start our preliminary budget, but we will adjust that as soon as we get the final number. Uh, the state shared revenue, um, some of you may remember last year, the state implemented a supplemental municipal aid which helped significantly for 2024's budget. It was about $2 million that was added to our budget annually. Uh, some significant purchases or um, increases that were uh, offset with that are included the three new firefighter positions, uh, some additional equipment that was needed. So that payment actually came also with an increase annually. So we're expecting about a $275,000 increase to that payment for 2025. With that change in the uh, state shared revenue formula, there are some additional restraints uh, and requirements for us in order to maintain um, effort in law enforcement and fire protection or emergency medical services. So each year the fire uh, chief and police chief have to certify that we are spending similar or more money towards those services annually or filling these spots on our service that um, more or equal to the previous year. So with the money came a couple of things that we have to make sure we do moving forward in the budget. The last item that's related to the state that I wanted to mention is the expenditure restraint program. The city receives about $650,000 annually uh, from the state by restraining our expenses. So the uh, anticipated restraint that we will see is 3.2%. So the, the state looks at the amount that the general fund has budgeted in 24, and if we stay underneath the 3.2%, and there is a little factor for net new construction in there, then we get that 650,000. So it does restrain us to what we can spend or what we can budget for for the next year. So those are all the uh, state considerations that we have at this moment. Additionally, for some salary and benefit uh, numbers, we have not finalized health insurance figures for 2025, so I can't share those with you today. We do have a meeting scheduled this week to hopefully go over those. But Wisconsin Retirement S uh, System has released what the city will be required and employees will be required to contribute on behalf of the pension system. There is a 0.05% increase on the general staff, which includes um, pretty much anyone who's not police or fire. And so the new contribution rate will be 6.9 for 5% of salaries. Police and fire, uh, well, police has an increase and fire has a slight decrease. So you can see those figures uh, on the screen there. In addition, 
employees are also required to pr contribute a 6.95% uh, amount to the pension as well. For salaries, the transit contract already has been settled and that is a 3% increase to salaries. Both police union contracts, which are the uh, supervisory and there's a non-supervisory officers union, they agreed um, and went have a contract for 3.5% increase for 2025. We are looking for um, a, doing a cost of living adjustment uh, similar to what Social Security will get for the non-represented employees. And then for the fire contract, we actually are, we do not have a settled contract. So that contract expired December 31st of 2023. And we're actually working through mediation to come up with the final figures for that. Uh, not sure if we'll have those in time for budget, but we will put in a factor accordingly. And lastly, my uh, shameless plugs for reminders as we go through budget season. Uh, there was the budget schedule that was previously published and filed um, by council on July 1st. That came from the city administrator. If you need a copy of that, I'm more than happy to provide it to you to make sure you know when meetings are. Um, please mark your calendar because we all know how fun budget is. <laughs> 2025 to 2029 capital improvement plan is incorporated into the budget schedule again as we look to transition to a new way of looking at capital planning. And again, just a, a reminder that the assessment notices have been mailed. This is year three of five of that revaluation contract. So there will be more re, uh, evalu assessment notices coming back from that revaluation. So if you have constituents with questions, the assessor's office is happy to help. I'm more than happy to help to, um, as well. Thank you. All right, thanks, Caitlin. Questions from Alders? Alder Prella? Thank you very much for the great presentation and please share. Thank you. Alder Bellinger? Thank you again. It, it was a fantastic presentation, so I appreciate the update and the information. I'm just curious as when you expect the shared revenue from the state, what, when does that supposed to come in? So we will be receiving it any day. We, ha we get the transit aid uh, on a quarterly basis and then the uh, state shared revenue, if it hasn't been deposited, it will be any day now. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions from Alders? All right, seeing none, we'll proceed with the agenda. Thank you, Caitlin. All right, well, good evening, everybody. Uh, I know a lot of folks are here for several different reasons uh, on the agenda, but uh, uh, tonight we actually have a very special recognition. Um, for the first time in 13 years, uh, we have a group of guests from our Japanese sister city, Subame, uh, here. So I'd ask the students and the chaperones if you'd like to come up uh, uh, and come up to the podium as well. Yep. So it's... So it's with great pleasure and profound honor that I welcome our esteemed guests from Subame, Japan to the wonderful city of Sheboygan. Today marks a significant milestone in the enduring partnership between our cities. And I'm thrilled to, have the, uh, to celebrate this momentous occasion with all of you. Um, this is the first time, like I said, in 13 years that we've had guests from our sister city in Japan uh, visit right here. Up in front here, we have uh, members of the Mayor's International Committee uh, you guys should just give a wave, uh, who have been working diligently at rebuilding and strengthening uh, this partnership uh, with both of our sister cities. So we're really excited to continue to grow this partnership. Our sister city relationship is not merely uh, a formality, but it is a bridge that connects our two nations and our communities through shared value, mutual respect, and a common vision for a brighter future. This partnership embodies the spirit of collaboration and understanding that transcends borders and enriches lives of all of our citizens. The bonds that we forge together between our sister city relationships will foster deeper cultural understanding, stimulate economic opportunities, and promote greater understanding between our two communities. Whether this is through student exchanges, cultural programs, or collaborative projects, we are committed to nurturing this partnership and continue to discover uh, as we pioneer this journey together. The last few days, uh, the students have been spending their time traveling all over Sheboygan 
visiting our schools, many of our businesses, restaurants, parks, and everything that makes Sheboygan great. I wanna thank all the host families that took time uh, and uh, uh, some uh, treasures as well to host uh, the students and the chaperones for their visit right here. And to our friends from Subame, I extend a heartfelt, grateful uh, thank you for taking your time and patience as you uh, enjoy our community as well as the Midwest. Your presence here today is a testament of how strong our enduring relationship has been these last few decades. And I'd like to thank my friend, Mayor Suzuki, who's watching the council meeting today from Japan for his leadership and willingness to continue this journey as sister cities together. In closing, I would like to express my sincerest appreciation to everyone that is working tirelessly uh, to strengthen and grow all of our sister city partnerships. So thank you so much. And of course, um, we have a gift that I'd like to present uh, to our guests. It is um, simple but symbolic. So obviously, uh, you know, we are proud fans of the Milwaukee Brewers. Uh, they are our baseball team. Uh, so I want to present with each of you a baseball hat from the Milwaukee Brewers. There you go. All right, and now uh, our guests will say a few words, so. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you uh, very much for uh, welcoming us so warmly today. Um, I am Masaru Yoshizawa. I am part of the delegation from Tsubame City. So we have come to uh, our sister city, Sheboygan, uh, with four student goodwill ambassadors and two city officials and one middle school teacher. Um, our cities uh, became sister cities 28 years ago. After the merger in 2006 that created the new Tsubame City, we began uh, student exchanges. So this is our first visit in 13 years. Although there was a period when our exchanges were paused, we are deeply grateful to um, Mayor Sorensen and uh, Ms. Veronica and uh, Mayor of International Committee and host families and everyone here. So uh, I appreciate it. Um, so thank you for your understanding and the cooperation in restarting the exchanges. So we are now on our sixth day here, and we are very impressed by the people, nature, history, and the culture of Sheboygan. Now I'm a big fan of Sheboygan City and Bratwurst, of course. <laughs> okay, so uh, thank you. Um, so here, uh, let the students share their experiences with you. Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm Ruta Otabe. Nice to meet you. I enjoyed swimming in the Lake Michigan at Waller Park. Um, I think Lake Michigan's water is clean and beautiful. I want to visit Sebogan City again. I love this city. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Hiyori Honda. I have had a great time since we came here. I think the city's public library is really good. <laughs> I was surprised that there are a lot of differences from Japan. I'm happy because I visited a lot of great places. I would like to Come back here. Thank you so much. Hello, my name is Ayuka Ohashi. I have had a wonderful time since we came here. I enjoyed swimming and talking to people in Shiboygan. People are so kind. 
I have made a lot of good memories. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. My name is Yukari Shimiz. I came to Shaboygan City and experienced a lot of things. My favorite is the beach around Lake Michigan. The sunset was very beautiful. If I have a chance to visit next time, I would like to see the morning sun. Thank you very much. So um, I also learned some Shebayuganese, like um, by now, hope, go, go pack to go. <laughs> you betcha. Okay. Uh, so uh, tomorrow we will leave Shebayugan City, oh, which we don't want to, but so we will share what we have learned about Shebayugan with the people of Tsubame City in Japan. So we hope to increase opportunities for direct cultural exchanges. We aim to strengthen this bond and pass it on to the next generation. We hope that our international exchange will continue to grow like the tree we planted at the Peace Park. That, and that the friendship between our cities will become even stronger. Once again, thank you for your warm hospitality. We wish for the continued development of our, of our friendship. Thank you very much. All right, well, I just wanna thank uh, the students uh, and our guests again. I also do wanna give a special shout out uh, to my assistant, Veronica Valdez, sitting up front here. Uh, she did a terrific job uh, wrangling together the itinerary uh, international travel stuff, uh, which is always fun and exciting. So thank you, Veronica, for all your hard work. And and more to come with growing sister city relationships. And if folks watching online and here, if you're in, ever interested in getting involved uh, with helping out our sister city programming, please reach out to my office. So I know we have a long agenda today, uh, so I'm looking forward to this council meeting um, and having some fruitful and productive conversations. Thank you. Okay, and if folks do wanna move on up, feel free to recombobulate. Okay, we're gonna be moving on to the public hearing presentation uh, for the evening. So just some groundwork, uh, ground rules uh, before we jump into the public presentation. Public hearings are limited to three minutes each. State your name uh, and your address as well. Please be respectful. Um, I know a lot of folks are here to speak tonight, um, so please keep concise to time uh, and make sure everyone uh, sticks to that as well. So, all right, first hearing is hearing number eight, hearing number 42425, pursuant to notice published by the city clerk, this hearing is to allow interested parties to be heard related to amendments of various sections of the Sheboygan Municipal Code, correcting various errors identified in the current zoning code. Anyone wishing to be heard on this item? Anyone wishing to be heard on this item? Anyone wishing to be heard? Seeing none, Alder Decker. Thank you, Mayor. I move to close the hearing. Second. Moved and seconded. <laughs> okay. All right, all those in favor uh, of closing the hearing, please state aye. 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 Uh, any, any objections? All right, that hearing is closed. All right, hearing number five, 2425, pursuant to notice, published in letters sent by the city clerk, this hearing is to allow interested parties in to be heard and relevant to a proposed amendment of the Sh city of Sheboygan's official zoning map. The purpose of this amendment is to change the use district classification of property located at 3100 Superior Avenue uh, from class suburban office to class suburban office planned unit development overlay. 
Anyone wishing to be heard on this item? All right, sir. Uh, thank you, you. Three minutes. State your name and address. My name's Todd Rader. I'm representing my mother, Dolores Rader, who lives at 1524 North 29th Street. And my reason is maybe clarification. The request for amendment talks about changing from office to plan development. Could someone please tell me if the plan development represents adding new residential homes to 29th Street? Is that what's happening? Or is there a possibility of offices being built in that? I don't know if anyone. So, yeah, hearings aren't for Q&A. It's just for you to make your, your point and information to the council. OK. My only, I guess my only concern beyond that would be the, there are several lots that are empty on 29th Street. And both myself and my sister would like to purchase one of those lots that would be adjacent to my mother's home. If there's development going on, we would hope that there'd be the ability to bid on or purchase lots on 29th Street. Uh, I guess that's really all I want to be heard about. I'll call my alderman later in the week for more information. All right, thank you. Anyone else wishing to be heard on this item? Anyone wishing to be heard? Final call, anyone wishing to be heard? Seeing none, Alder Decker. Thank you, Mayor, I move to close the hearing. Second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor of closing this hearing, please state aye. Aye. Any objections? All right, that hearing is closed. All right, item 10, hearing number 62425, pursuant to notice published by city clerk. This hearing is to allow interested parties to hear relevant to proposed plan unit development and general development plan designated by Malibu Apartments. Anyone wishing to be heard on this item? Anyone wishing to be heard on this item, Jim? My name is Jim Van Akron, 432 Lincoln Avenue, Sheboygan. Um, I didn't have enough time to speak about everything I wanted to initially, so I'd like to continue my discussion, especially the shoreline restoration management plan that I hope you looked at. This was something the city authorized, the city paid money for, and it speaks volumes about what should be developed on our shoreline, and it raises some um, very serious concerns about development along our shoreline. And in the plan, it states, in recent years, harsh storms and increasing lake levels have become typical of the Great Lakes, and specifically Lake Michigan. Storm winds cause rapid changes in lake water levels by dragging water downward, resulting in a temporary rise in local water level. This phenomenon is, is referred to as storm surge. Storm surge Surges on open coasts, such as Sheboygan Coast, can cause one to two feet rise in lake levels. With storms increasing in frequency and intensity in recent years, storm surges have more potential to cause damage to the shoreline as impacts are more frequent. Beyond storm surges, waves caused by storms have also presented a challenge to Wisconsin coastlines. High wind events build large, deep water waves on Lake Michigan. Wind speed, length of water surface, exposed to the wind, and duration are all factors that contribute to the varied characteristics of deep water waves. A typical fall storm can result in deep water offshore wave heights greater than 17 feet in a short period of time. These deep water waves dictate shallow water wave conditions. Deep water waves diffract and refract in response to sensing the lake bottom and near shore obstacles. Determining the characteristics of a shallow water wave. While the energy of deep water wave is often dissipated by the time the wave reaches the shoreline, elevated water levels and significant near shore erosion has led to shoreline conditions where large waves are attacking the coast. Along the city of Sheboygan's shoreline, 
The increased erosion has led to receding shorelines. These receding shorelines have led to bluff erosion, collapse, speech loss, and direct wave impacts to critical city infrastructure. One of those infrastructures was the city had plantings in a stormwater catch basin put in the beach at the foot of Michigan Avenue less than 10 years ago. Once the lake water ro rose, all that was wiped out, all that money wasted. Don't make the same mistake here. We like to think that there is a technical solution to rising lake levels in destructive ways. There isn't one that can stand the test of time. As a child, I lived next to the property. I remember when Optenberg's was, a protected, was protected by a U-shaped concrete rubble revetment. This was needed then. Climate change creates an even greater threat to whatever type of building will go on this site. Let's use smart growth here. It is always hard when a governmental body goes down a road in planning and then has to change. Jim? I, I can finish and wrap it up. Yep. I was on the school board for seven years. I understand this, but if it's the right thing to do, you should do it. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask that we do keep clapping to a minimum just so we can keep, keep the hearings going. So anyone? Scott, next? Yes, please. Thank you. Name, I, address, three minutes. Scott Hansen, 611 Alabama Avenue. Uh, I had a final point that I wanted to make, and it had to do with, with winter parking concerns. Uh, the parking of vehicles on designated snow emergency routes, boulevards, cul-de-sacs, and dead ends is completely prohibited during the period of a snow emergency. Uh, the South 7th Street is a snow emergency route. The Malibu Apartments would impact parking on the Clara Avenue and George Avenue cul-de-sacs in addition to the 7th Street location. These, this consists of all three parking streets around the Malibu apartment site. Neighbors, employees, and long-term residents of this neighborhood already deal with a shortage of viable parking spaces during the winter. The additional vehicles, whether those of apartment owners or visitors, will likely make winter parking much more difficult, especially during a snow emergency. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Anyone else wishing to be heard on this item? Anyone else wishing to be heard? Anyone on this one? Yep, come here. And if folks want to queue up too, if, if you want to go next, that would be helpful. Name, address, and then just make sure the mic is yeah. up. Hi, I'm Eric Neve. I live at 711 North 5th Street. Um, I just heard about the hearing and so my remarks will be somewhat off the cuff. I apologize for that. Um, I was working down by Cedar Grove, Belgium area today, and um, I really appreciate Mr. Van Akron's points today, but my argument is more or less a not in my backyard because I view the lake in Sheboygan as the backyard of us all. When I work down in Cedar Grove, like Belgium, you know, that stretch of all privatized houses, I'm, I'm working there and I think, wow, what an amazing opportunity. They get to enjoy this space and I barely ever see anyone there. I work there almost every day. And then I drive back to Sheboygan and there's spot after spot after spot of public access to the lake. We heard from um, our visitors from Japan as well. That was one of their, their top things that they, they loved about coming to visit our city. I think that um, more and more development, especially on that access point to our biggest natural resource is a really um, bad decision, basically. I think, um, secondly, maybe of equal, important, uh, equal importance, the Malibu apartments are named after, I'm assuming, this phrase Malibu of the Midwest. This uh, book, the first, I don't know, four, five pages, are all pictures of kite surfers and surfers who have given you like basically free advertising. And now instead of offering them, uh, you know, a direct uh, communication about what should happen to this spot that they've really developed, everyone knows it's Kite Beach, we're um, imposing something upon that space. I think it's uh, somewhat indirectly exploitative of the people who have spent so much time and energy on this space for free. They've never asked anything of you. 
And I would ask that you just consider that, that kind of labor uh, as equally valid to any of these other concerns that I think are very, I'm very glad other people have brought up the more practical concerns, but this one's more of a, yeah, a love of the lake, a love of the kite surfers, a love of a more people being drawn into the space because of those very things. So don't take that away too quickly. Thank you. Next. My name's Christine Potter. Um, I'm here on, kind of on behalf of my mother and my address, at address. 1318 South 7th Street. Thank you. So we're actually located at the midpoint between Georgia and Kentucky. Um, we look across the street and we see the lake and we see Kite Park and then King Park. Um, one of the reasons that we moved here back in 2000 was to have the benefit of the natural resources of the lake actually as almost like a part of our front yard. The idea, I'm, I understand that we need residential and I don't have a problem with housing, but to look across my street at a 215 unit apartment complex after moving here for the lake view is just sounds ugly to me. I wanted to raise that issue. I'm sure other people on our street on that area would agree. As far as the erosion concern, we actually moved here from Southern California. So one of the things that we got away from was the diving cliffs, the, the, all of the apartments and homes that have just been demolished from building on shorelines. So that is also a concern that um, I think we agree should be taken into consideration. And then I can't remember the name of the grant that the city got uh, in order to deal with the sanitation issue there. Um, the stuff that's underground that's made it a sanitation issue. I just feel like that money could be spent on in better in other areas. Um, for that kind of cleanup. The part, this area gets used all the time. And um, it just seems like with such a grant that this is a, a sad way to use it. Thank you. All right, anyone else wish to be heard on this item? Yeah, my name's Richard Peel. I live at 629 Clara Avenue. My home will be directly impacted by your decision. Between my mother and I, we've owned that property for 50 years. I bought it from my mother with the intention of spending my retirement there. You're gonna take all that away and force me to move at 71 years old because I won't live next to 215 apartments that travel day and night, 24 hours a day, with the parking headaches it'll create, the traffic jams it's gonna create, is why take away the green, the, the green space? The kiters enjoy that area immensely. They brought population down there. Kids come down there and play ball with their parents. They can't play in the Kings Park because all the, everything around Kings Park is geared to small children. What about the kids that are 12, 13 years old want to go out and practice throwing a softball or a football with their dad or a friend? They need the length and the area to do that. There aren't a lot of other places around the city on the south side that they can go and do that. They'd have to go all the way up the old shooting park. You know, that's a mile out of the way. This place has been there for how long has Ottenberg been gone? 24 years? And it's been fine, empty, all this time. Now all of a sudden some developer comes along and you guys want to develop something that doesn't need to be there. We don't want the city of Sheboygan looking like the New York and San Francisco skylines or Chicago. We want to be able to see the lake, enjoy the lake. Please don't build this, don't allow it to be built. Make it something better. 
that all the people in, city, in the city of Sheboygan can enjoy. They're already enjoying it. Let's make it a little better. Thank you. Thank you. All right, anyone else wishing to be heard on this item? Anyone else wishing to be heard? Final call, anyone else wishing to be heard? Seeing none, Alder Decker. Thank you, Mayor, I move to close the hearing. Second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor of closing the hearing, state aye. Aye. Anyone opposed, the hearing is closed. Next hearing, item number 72425, pursuant to notice published by the city clerk, this hearing is to allow interested parties to be heard relative to the proposed unit, proposed updates to the local floodplain zoning ordinance. Anyone wishing to be heard on this item? Anyone wishing to be heard? Anyone wishing to be heard? Final call, anyone wishing to be heard? Seeing none, Alder Decker. Thank you, Mayor, I move to close the hearing. Second. Moved and seconded, all those in favor of closing the hearing, state aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? All right, that hearing is closed. <coughs> all right, I'm gonna exe um, exercise my executive authority and I'm going to move up item 44 uh, on the council agenda to be taken up. So. 44, RC number 71, 24, 25 by the licensing hearing in public safety committee to whom met on July 25th, 24, 2024 to consider a request by Dave Rapinski, agent of Dave Susan, holder of alcoholic beverage number 1089 and modify voluntary conditions imposed in lieu of a hearing on revocation of said license. Alder Decker, or excuse me, Alder Rust. I move to receive the RC and accept the amendments. Second. Moved and seconded. Alder Rust. I move to amend the amendment to remove all voluntary conditions and stipulations. All right, there's been a motion to amend second. to remove all voluntary conditions and stipulations. Is, and there's been a second? All right, we'll discuss the amendment. Alder Lefebvre. You have comments on this item? I'm just saying that uh, I think this is a fair settlement and uh, I, I'm hoping that everyone is, is happy with it. Uh, if we go back 12 months, uh, there hasn't been any major disruptions and uh, what we were talking about was having a 12 month period of time. I always had a problem with not having a solid timeline. It was too open-ended, so I, I appreciate this. All right, thank you, Alder Lefebvre. Any other discussion on this item? Seeing none, all those in favor of approving the amendments to remove all stipulations and conditions, please state aye. Aye. Any objections? All right, seeing none, we're back at the motion as amended. Any discussion on the motion as amended? All right, seeing none, this will be a roll call vote. That's approved. Dave, I can't let you speak. Oh, I want to thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right, if folks could just keep their Comments to a minimum as you move out. Feel free to talk in the hall. We still have business to conduct. All right, back to consent agenda items 13 through 18, Alder Decker. Thank you, Mayor. I move to receive and file all ROs, receive all RCs, and adopt all resolutions and ordinances. Second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion on any of the items on the consent agenda? Seeing none, this is a roll call vote. Eight eyes. All right, those items are approved. Next, RO number 392425 by the City Plan Commission, to whom was referred General Ordinance number 132425 by Alder Bellinger, amending various articles of Section Chapter 107 
of the municipal code as to make updates to the floodplain zoning ordinance in order to comply with the requirements of the Department of Natural Resources. Alder Bellinger. I move to adapt the ordinance. Second. Mo moved and seconded. Discussion on this item. <laughs> Seeing no discussion, uh, this is a roll call vote. Eight eyes. All right, that's approved. All right, item 20, RO number 46, 24, 25 by city clerk, submitting a permanent change of premise for the Weill Center Foundation. Alder Rust. I ask to suspend the rules. Any objection to suspension? Seeing none, please proceed with your motion. I move to grant the license. Great, there's been a motion and second. Any discussion, Alder Bellinger. Uh, could I just get a reason why we are suspending the rules? Anyone want to speak on this one? Um, I just know, uh, working with the Wild Center, they reached out. They just want to have this ready uh, for the boat race block party this Friday. Okay. Yep. Good reason. Thank you. Yep. Alder Rust, you have a comment? My, my question's been answered. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Seeing no more cues on this item, this is a roll call vote. Eight eyes. All right, that's approved. All right, 21, RO number 40, 24, 25 by City Plan Commission, to whom was referred General Ordinance number 12, 24, 25 by Elder Persons Ramey, and RO number 33, 24, 25 by the City Clerk, submitting an application to amend the City of Sheboygan's official zoning map of the Sheboygan Zoning Ordinance to change the use district classification of property located at 3100 Superior Avenue from Class Suburban Office to Class Suburban Office Planned Unit Development. Alder Ramey. I move to uh, file the RO and adopt the ordinance. Second. Moved and seconded. Discussion on this item. Seeing no cues, this is a roll call vote. Eight eyes. That is approved. Moving along. Items 20 through 28 will be referred to their respective committees. Next, item 29, resolution number 522425 by Elder Persons Mitchell and Prilla, authorizing the appropriate city officials to execute an assignment of real property purchase agreement authorization of the purchase of 930 North 8th Street at the aforementioned parcel numbers from INZ Properties LLC. Alder Prella. I make a motion to suspend the rules and adopt the resolution. All right, there's uh, Second. moved and seconded. Any discussion? Alder Bellinger. I just again would like to know why we're suspending the rules. City Administrator. Yes, this is for, uh, this is for the uh, purchase of uh, property that um, we had discussed in regards to development and the closing would be before the next meeting. Alder Decker. Uh, I have a, a little bit of cleanup to add on to this. I uh, make move, move to amend the resolution so as to approve an updated assignment that reflects the assignment is of not the July 9th contract, but the 23rd, July 23rd amendment to the contract between Secure Fund LLC, INZ Properties, L and INZ Properties LLC. Not only the July 9th contract. Oh, not only the July 9th contract, that's correct. All right, there's been a motion to second. amend, and there's a second. Any discussion on the amendment? Alder Perella. Yeah, so I'm not familiar with the Ju I, I, I don't see the July 23rd amendment to the contract in the packet. Did I miss it? City Attorney? You did not miss it. Uh, I got an email from the attorney on the other side of this transaction this afternoon telling me, oops, I forgot there was a July 23rd amendment that we have to deal with. The July 23rd amendment, all it does is clarifies the the particular legal description, so it's a fairly minor change. It, it doesn't change anything else. So what are the changes again, please? It clarifies, the. it actually provides the exact description rather than a general description as was in the July 9 uh, agreement. So no substantive or substantial change to the it's not a substantial change. We understood what the what what we were 
getting into, they are just being more careful properly, being more precise about what the, the property description is. All right, thank you. All right, any discussion on the amendment? Seeing none, all those in favor of accepting the amendment, state aye. Aye. Any objections? All right, back to the motion as amended. Any other discussion on the item as amended? Seeing none, this is a roll call vote. Eight eyes. That is approved. Next 30, <coughs> resolution number 482425 by Elder Persons Ballinger and Prella, approving the general development plan submitted by Malibu Apartments for construction of Malibu Apartments on the aforementioned parcel number within planned unit development zone. Elder Bellinger? I move to adapt the resolution. Is there a second? Moved and seconded. Discussion on this item? Elder Rust. I would invite our city administrator to uh, talk on some of the myths that have been flowing around this, specifically the size of this apartment built complex city. and um, some of the other things that have been flowing around. City administrator. Yeah, um, so we'll ask, I'll uh, we'll probably start with Diane um, to kind of talk about the parking. I know that's been a, um, a hot issue, obviously parking, is not universal, so each type of project we try to look at, um, specifically when we're doing a PUD, we look at what is needed in the project. So, um, Diane, if you could talk about that a little bit, and then also the um, the remediation plan, um, the agencies that are involved and the different organizations that are involved with this particular one because of the contamination that's on that site. Um, I know there were some references to this site being a park. It is not a park, it is private property that is heavily contaminated. So um, there's a lot of groups that have been involved with trying to come up with the appropriate plan. So if you could talk about those. Planning yeah. director. Thank you. So the city has been working with Sheboygan County who has a grant with the U.S. Department of Environmental Protection Agency to assist with brownfield and contaminated sites. The grant covers expenses such as assessing the condition of the contamination and creating mitigation plans. Through proper procurement, Stantec, an engineering firm from Mequon, was contracted to complete the work. All work must be in compliance with both FEMA at the federal level and the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. The project plan before you this evening has been reviewed by both agencies and is in compliance. As to the parking, the project includes 1.5 parking stalls per housing unit. This project includes both, as we heard tonight, two and three bedroom, but also many um, efficiencies in one bedroom apartments. All parking stalls needed for this new apartment will be on site. The street parking is for public use. The parking is proposed to be changed on the street to be slanted stalls to increase the parking for people to enjoy the beach, the current residents along Clara and Georgia, as well as patrons to the local restaurant. The street parking is not needed for the new residential units. Just to add on that a little bit and it'll kind of segue into the city engineer. Um, the site plan is designed is the developer site plan. That is not the plan for the city streets. Obviously city streets go through a public vetting process. We have not went through design on what the cul-de-sacs would look like. So um, we're a long way from obviously once a project gets approved, then we move forward with our side of it. Our, our intent, um, we had met with the kite group um, individually, uh, Mayor Sorensen and I did, um, and the intent is to enhance access to the beach and using the street accesses as that opportunity. So um, I, some great points were brought up this evening, but those will be vetted out as engineering goes through the actual design of that area. So we're a long way from um, those cul-de-sacs being um, put together and ultimately built. So that'll be a long process and obviously the public will be engaged in that. So um, with that, if uh, Kevin Jump, city engineer, if you could weigh in on the information regarding traffic. Um, and I know Jordan's here, so we'll probably have him weigh in on some of the comments regarding the affluent flow. Um, but stormwater and all that, If Kevin, if you could address that, please. So yeah, there's definitely going to be an increase in traffic. Um, I, we don't believe it's going to be a major concern. Um, there will, 
it, it won't cause significant congestion in the area, um, but there will definitely be an increase in traffic. Um, but there's also multiple ways in and out of the neighborhood or in and out of the development. Um, there's A Street just a block over. Um, so there's several ways to get in and out which shouldn't cause too much congestion. Um, I'm gonna touch a little bit on the sewers. The sewers in the area, there's a 30 inch sewer that runs to the Kentucky lift station in on 7th Street. There's a 30 inch and an, sorry, a 24 inch and an 18 inch sewer in Clara Avenue that run directly to the interceptor. Um, so from a sewer standpoint, there's really no concerns of creating backups due to the volume that, would, the, that these apartments will develop. Um, touch base a little bit on the interceptor sewer. So the city contracted with a consultant in 2020 to start reviewing the condition of the interceptor sewer. Um, we found that the pipe, even though it's from 1930s, is in really good condition. Um, but we are going to, we are working with FEMA to develop a plan to, to protect the manholes and protect the important infrastructure to the city. Um, we applied to, for a FEMA grant a couple years ago, and it's just a process of working through with FEMA. Um, hopefully we'll get some response, positive response in the next few weeks. Kevin, city administrator. Jordan, do you have anything to add to that? No, um, Mr. Jump did a great job with that. And just uh, certainly the concerns brought up about the, the interceptor itself, um, you know, are valid as far as um, needing some work on that interceptor and the, the grant that Mr. Jump referred to. I think the this apartment would not um, add to those concerns. The concerns are not with capacity. Adding this number of units would not be um, a significant addition to the flows in the interceptor or to the plant. So um, basically they're, they're kind of separate issues. Uh, the apartment would not increase any concerns with the infrastructure there in my mind. Thank you. City Administrator. Thank you. Uh, we have the developer here this evening as well. Um, we asked him to come up and go through kind of the project presentation. So um, we all have the current version of what's being proposed and what ultimately is being considered this evening. And then if you have any questions for him, um, please feel free to ask. All right. Great. Thank you, Casey. And thank you, uh, city staff and council members. Um, as it was stated earlier, uh, I met with Andrew and some of the uh, Kite Board community today and had a really good constructive conversation with them. Um, really appreciate the cordial, um, how, how nice everyone was, and um, we, we will absolutely try to incorporate uh, many of your ideas, as many as we can. And uh, we want to be good neighbors. Uh, the last thing we want to do is have upset neighbors. We want to be good neighbors to everyone around us. Um, so if you can pull up the... Uh, uh, Presentation again, Meredith, there? Okay, yeah, so this is page two we're on here. Uh, so this is a helicopter point of view of the site here. Um, obviously, as mentioned earlier, this is a brownfield site um, with cont heavy contamination under it. Um, so this development is going to mitigate those uh, contaminated soils. Right now, it is an open greed field space, so rainwater goes through the soils and further makes it worse. Uh, groundwater contamination continues to spread as of today. Our project will largely ca cap those uh, contaminants and then properly uh, pipe them into a sizable six foot by 200 foot buried steel pipe uh, that will uh, properly contain it and, and naturally release the uh, storms sewer uh, or storm water into the system, uh, meeting and exceeding the DNR uh, requirements. Our project also meets and exceeds all landscaping uh, requirement points from the city. Uh, on the diagram, uh, it's kind of hard to see with how small it is there, but uh, one of the concerns was the uh, ordinary high water mark. Uh, the city has a lakeshore over, overlay district no disturbance policy of 75 feet uh, setback. Our phase one building, uh, the closest point to that is the southeast corner of the building, which is 135 feet from that ordinary high water mark. And phase two is uh, 200, at its closest point is 225 feet away from that 
ordinary high water mark. Uh, next slide, please. There we go. Okay. This is a rendering of uh, off of 7th Street, so your back would be to 7th Street and uh, Sheboygan Paper Box Company. Um, obviously, one of the big things, and it was mentioned by a couple uh, uh, residents earlier, was uh, the site brings people to this area. And that's exactly what we want to accomplish as well. Um, we're going to bring more residents to Sheboygan's lakefront, and a lot of those people who, who will rent from us likely would not have an opportunity to live on the lakefront if not for this project. The building unit mix is 157 units uh, in this first phase uh, total. Uh, it comes to 24 studio apartments, 45 one-bedroom units, 18 one-bedroom plus dens, 62 be two-bedrooms, and eight three-bedroom units. So over half the units are one bedroom or less. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, yeah, this is a view from Clara Avenue. And uh, as the city mentioned, Clara Avenue, this is just a rendering that my architect put together that is completely on the city and how they engineer and design the Clara Avenue as well as Georgia Avenue. Uh, but this is a view from, from Clara as it currently stands. Um, next slide. And here's a view with your back to the beach. Uh, so again, conceptual uh, right now, uh, the landscaping as well as um, the particulars and the design, uh, the lower level being the restaurant space and then the four stories above. And, then, and here's a rendering of the pool deck area which will be above the parking structure. Uh, there'll be a pool area, outdoor grilling stations along the right as well as uh, lounge areas. Next slide. Okay, here is the first floor plan. Uh, the ground level features uh, 141 interior parking stalls plus 74 surface stalls. And then on top of that, there's also the street parking that's unaccounted for in our parking ratios. Approximately 3,700 square feet of commercial space. Uh, the interior parking structure will have EV charging capabilities. Most of our properties, we, we start with about five to 10 percent of the parking stalls have uh, outlets for EV charging, but we also have the ability to add more. It's designed properly so we can add more charging stations throughout the interior parking. Uh, within there is also pet wash stations, bike repair stations, and interior and exterior bar bike racking parking as well. Uh, the next slide is uh, level two. And within level two, we, with lakefront views, will be a large community room, large fitness center, outdoor pool, and the lounge and grilling stations that I mentioned earlier. Uh, additional notes of interest are two elevators within the structure uh, and multiple staircases as well. Um, one point to, to note as well is we really wanted to maximize the views, the lakefront views, of course. So the northern wall and the southern walls are stepped back, or stepped out, I should say. Uh, to really give those units all the way up the building uh, their own lakefront views. And next slide, and here's the, the uh, floor plans for levels uh, three through five. Um, it stays consistent throughout the building up to the top level. I kind of went through that quick, but I'm definitely here for any questions you have. Um, all right, uh, Bob, Alder Faye. Yeah. Uh, there were some questions by the uh, community about uh, <clears throat> erosion retention. Now, uh, as I understand it, whose responsibility would be to pay for that? I guess I'm not too sure on that one. My pro our property line will end prior to the beach, so I, I don't know how that will all look in the picture of things there because I don't own the beach, so the erosion would be you know, to the east of us. City Administrator? Yeah, so for this project, uh, none of this would be on the beach. The, si the beach own is owned by the city, so we would maintain ownership, access, all of that. So responsibility of beach erosion would ultimately fall on the city um, because it has nothing to do with this project. We have ownership all the way along through that area, um, essentially from Clara North. We own all the beach all the way through. So um, anything on the site, um, would be obviously an ownership responsibility. Yeah. So that would be on the owner of the property. Yeah. Right. Yep. Any follow-up, Alder Lefebvre? No. Alder Perello. 
Um, I have a few comments, but also, would you be able to give us a timing? Should this project be approved tonight? As far as the build out, how that would go? Yeah, um, if it gets approved tonight, we'll move forward with the closing of the land, and then we will, uh, it, there's a lot of uh, upfront work uh, as far as still getting, we still need state approved plans. Um, that Those are in the works within the next 30 to 60 days, we should have those. Um, if those go through and we get everything kind of lined up, um, we could potentially start some of the site uh, 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 contamination work and, uh, and some of the piling work yet this year. Um, latest would be spring of next year but uh, we're hoping to get moving now rather than, than wait, wait till spring, so. So you have an idea of uh, the end of phase one? Oh, sure, yeah, sorry. Um, it's about an 18 to 24 month build out for phase one. So it's a, it's a sizable 157 units at about a year and a half to two years, yep. And then would the, the phase two start right after? That, that'll be a, kind of an absorption. We'll, we'll, as we get the building built out, we'll make sure we're if it leases up before we're done construction, that's probably a good signal that we can move forward with phase two right away. So, but if not, obviously we'll we'll get phase one stabilized before we were to move forward. So, thank you. I want to thank you for your kindness and availability today, as well as all the constituents that came to speak tonight. We also received several emails, and I talked directly to a few people. As this building is going to be, this property is going to be in my district. Um, I, I just want to reiterate one more time what other people have reiterated already. Our uh, vacancy rate is low. The city needs housing, no doubt about that. And we all are for development. Um, I think in my case, I have approved in the last three and a half years few apartment buildings in my backyard, in my neighborhood, uh, so I have on record my commitment to the development in the city. However, um, I believe this building, this property, I truly feel is completely incongruent and inconsistent with the neighborhood. The size, the density, the height, the proximity to the beach. It is simply put inappropriate to my taste to my sense of aesthetics, to my love for the area, to my love for the Lake Michigan. Um, it's a black eye in that area to me. Um, of course, it will be, you know, for the residents that can afford it, the amenities will be great. But for the rest of the city, I don't think it's going to be that much of uh, value added. Uh, with that said, I'm not going to approve this project. Thank you, Alder Perillo. Alder Heidemann. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, this is an area that I drive almost every day because that's my way to get from the south side of Sheboygan to downtown. So I drive by Kite Park all the time. Um, I'm going to stay consistent with my last no vote because I believe it's too much for the area and, and for the neighborhood to all of a sudden put 157 units in there. I, I, I just, I can't imagine driving down there and being able to weave through all that traffic because even on a weekend with what's happening at King Park and everything else and with at Sheboygan Paper Box, it's hard to get through there. I can't imagine what the traffic is gonna be like going down there and again, um, if you came up with something that was a little smaller or something that I could accept that I could maybe actually see the lake when I drive by, I'd appreciate that, but I will again uh, be voting no against this. Thank you, Alder Hartman. Alder Rust. So I have a few things to say. First of all, we are truly lucky that the owner of that land did not put big fence around that and we were allowed to use it for the last 24 years. But also, like we've said before, it's contaminated. People shouldn't be walking on that to start with. And third of all, I believe the reason why we have so many apartments is to make this viable to 
clean up the land and still make money off of it. Is that correct? Yeah, it wouldn't work without the density. Yep. Right. So I understand the not how it looks, but we have an opportunity here, and I know it's not very popular, but an opportunity to clean up some dirty land that a, a manufacturer left for this city to figure out how to clean up and actually develop that land. We'll never be able to develop it if we aren't able to get somebody else who's willing to clean up a brownfield site. It's not cheap. We have to do our justice too of keeping land clean. Thank you. Thank you, Alder Rust. Alder Decker. Thank you, Mayor. Um, yes, I, I guess I, I, I'm an older guy, so I, I remember when it was Optenberg. And I remember what it looked like then. I it, remember Optenberg too, Gene. It wasn't that it, long. Ago. It, it, it wasn't a pretty sight. It didn't. You know, it didn't. You know, everybody complains about the, 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 uh, the, the, the sight to the to the lake. You couldn't see the lake when Optenberg was there. It was a, a factory, and it wasn't a pretty factory either. It was an old, run-down factory. It had it, it was it had, that had served its purpose for quite a few years. Now I remember when they, when it was taken down. the The plan was was that they were gonna that was gonna be developed. The, 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 the people I believe it's the people that own it now. It maybe it would have been somewhere between. Uh, they tore the factory down. They started doing some of the work, and the cost was what co was what what was left it. So now we've been sitting here for 20 plus years, and it's been an empty site. It's been great that the kite, kite surface have been able to use it, but it is private property. It is belong it belongs to someone, and uh, this uh, the, I, I believe we don't follow through with this. Like I said, the density is what's necessary to make it make this go. It's an opportunity to clean up a brownfield site. I, this contamination is flowing into Lake Michigan right now. I mean, this is not a safe environment for people to be around. And so I, I think we have an obligation to clean this, clean, help clean this site up. So I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be supportive of this. Thank you, Alder Decker. Alder Ramey. Thank you. I'm so conflicted because I do hear what, um, and received all the emails and I have nothing but empathy for those who live around that area and those who use that area. Um, honestly, my biggest concern is the environment and the contamination uh, and the fact that it's not just safe sitting there contaminated, it is constantly being expelled and, and expanding and getting worse. And if it's what I'm hearing is the only way to really clean that up and stop that contamination of our lake is by, by a development. I agree, I wouldn't, I mean, if it's not, I would love someone to share what, uh, what other the other opportunities are, because uh, I haven't heard any alternative. So if someone has an alternative, I would love to hear that, because my main concern, like I said, is the contamination. I agree, I think it's um, really large, and it doesn't fit, uh, but it, if, if that's the only way to pay for the contamination, I cannot think of an alternative. So again, I open up. If anyone does have an alternative, I'd love to hear that. Thank you, Alder Remy. Alder Bellinger. Thank you. Um, I agree with Alder Ramey's um, assessment too on, on, the, on the contamination. I was an alder for years ago between 2012 and 2018 and there were several different uh, proposals that were brought forth for this site and due to the, uh, the scope um, and the cost of the remediation, none of them w were able to, um, to go through and not obviously. And um, you know, so, there's, so, so there is that, so capping it is the, the best solution as far as the contamination goes. Um, I did, like everybody else on the council, receive a bunch of emails for this, and I, uh, I, a lot of them were very well written, very passionate, um, and I, I, I feel for the people that live in the neighborhood. Uh, but um, I also did some due diligence on my own. I called the city engineering staff and I went through on each one of the issues, whether it was the storm sewer, the sanitary sewer, the street, the parking, um, the, the runoff, um, all of that. And I asked the, the city engineering staff if they have an issue with any of this, if this will, project will negatively impact the infrastructure that we already have in place. And um, I was told no that will not impact uh, the infrastructure. I then asked the question, if, it, if you as an engineer and not a city employee felt that it would, would you say 
that it would impact? And uh, the answer I got was, it would be tough to say, to say that, but as a professional, um, the engineer said, yes, I would say that. Um, I would have that tough conversation if I thought that that um, was going to have a negative impact on the city. The city engineer's job is to make sure that the infrastructure that we have and the f future infrastructure that we're planning is safe for the residents of Sheboygan and any kind of development that we put in um, is going to um, not negatively impact that. So um, I am in favor of this. Um, I, I, I support what, what the development is. I am encouraged that you are willing to work with the residents and you met with them today. That is a good sign so that you're flexible with, with that in doing what you can to um, address concerns that they have. Um, I, I get, um, I, I've been getting complaints that, or not complaints, but um, comparisons that the Memorial Neighborhood site, um, and it would be, you know, wh why not there? Um, you know, I, I represent that, that area. Um, I would be happy for a high density solution for that. Um, there's a previous agreement in place with the Neighborhood Association and Aurora that that won't happen, but um, I, I'm not anti-development and it's not like, well, I, I, I'm not looking to force this along Grazia's district. Uh, I think it's, there's a problem with the site. This is a solution. We've had a problem for 20 some years. It hasn't been addressed. This is our chance to do something. And I think it is, a, it's a first class development. Uh, they've got a track record, and so I'm gonna support it. So thank you. Thank you, Alder Bellinger. Alder Lefebvre. Okay, uh, like a lot of people, I, I'm a lifelong resident of the city of Sheboygan, and I've fallen absolutely in love with our lakefront. So the idea of putting a large property on there that would obstruct a little bit the, the view of the lake is something that's a really bitter pill for me to, uh, you know, to swallow. But looking at uh, the idea that we've had 25 years of a terribly contaminated site and about the only way we really have come up, only real option that we have to clean this site is this program. And uh, I understand, and I got all the same emails that everybody else got, uh, the city engineers and uh, city administrator and everything has pretty much quashed uh, those concerns that they're not really that viable. Uh, don't want to have a lot of development, you know, obstructing the uh, the viewpoint of the, of the lake, but seeing the other uh, decent things on this, I think I'm going to be supporting this. Thank you, Alder Lefebvre. Alder Prelip. Yeah, I just wanted to add that it's almost a, it sounded to me a little bit like a fallacy, a fallacious, uh, some sort of premise that we are starting with, the idea that we accept the size because that's the only way that is going to be profitable. I don't know that. I mean, in the sense, I understand that the developers say so, but I, be, I, I don't even know how much it costs to clean it up. So is that really, that um, is the cleaning of the land really such a big impact? Has the city ever really looked into alternatives? Is that true that we couldn't find alternatives and solutions? Um, is that true that we couldn't develop it with smaller property, with a smaller property? And so these, these doubts, I understand from, from the profit perspective, I understand that. I'm, I'm sure the developer wants, and that's not, I mean, it's not, um, <laughs> that's, that's your business, right? So I understand you want to get the, the highest profit out of the property. I mean, that's your investment. I understand very well, but is that the fact that it has to be cleaned up and the fact that it has to be developed because you, we want development does not mean that we have to turn our back to critical thinking and looking for solutions that are more appropriate to the city, to the landscape, to the site. Um, I, I don't feel confident that we made and really went through 
uh, all the effort to, to find alternative solutions. Um, and again, I have nothing against development. Of course not, as I said, I have approved several. I have nothing against the developer. It's absolutely not, on the contrary. But I don't feel that we have done our due diligence to look at this opportunity um, to have alternatives, to implement alternatives also for the cleanup. City Administrator. Um, I can't say what's been done over the last 22 years. I know the city's worked diligently on a number of projects over the years. Um, and obviously the, the contamination um, is the number one issue. The number two issue um, that plagues this site as well is the water table. Obviously you're, you're two to four feet above um, the water table. So anything you do there, um, there are some, there is one house I believe on that property um, which they're, they run into water issues constantly is my understanding. Um, that is something the developer is working through. Um, they're, everything they're gonna do is gonna have to be on piles. So in lieu of any project that would serve as a cap, you would have to look at removing all of the material from that site and replacing it. So hauling all the contaminated material out and hauling all new con material in. Um, and then you're gonna have to have test walls to monitor that like we have in other areas of the city. So um, it's not an easy fix. I don't know what has been evaluated by um, prior staff um, looking at it. Ultimately, this is not a publicly owned site. So it's not something that the city, if we were to acquire it to go um, look at remediation, you're looking at expending about $4 million um, and then we become the responsible party, and then we'd be responsible for cleanup. Um, and even if you did clean the site up, you would still have the issue of the water table. So um, finding a project that would be able to uh, put anything um, over one story, I think, would be, would be of a challenge financially. All right, any other cues? All right, seeing no more cues, this will be a roll call vote. Five ayes, three noes. All right, that is approved. All right, item 31 and 38 will be referred to the respective committees. Now to reports of committees, RC number 36, 24, 25 by the Finance and Personnel Committee, to whom was referred direct referral resolution number 46, 24, 25 by Elder Persons Mitchell and Prella authorizing a contract between the City of Sheboygan and Tyler Technologies for purchase and implementation of advanced scheduling and time attendance software programs. Elder Prella. Uh, I make a motion to, to adopt the resolution. Second. Moved and seconded. Discussion on this item? Seeing none, this is a roll call vote. Eight ayes. All right, that's approved. 40, RC number 642425 by the Licensing Hearing and Public Safety Committee to whom was referred General Ordinance Number 112425 by Older Persons Rust and Lefebvre amending sections 3859 of Sheboygan Municipal Code is to modify regulations pertaining to consuming intoxicating beverages. Alder Rust. I move to receive the RC and adopt the ordinance. Okay. Moved and seconded. Discussion on this item? Seeing none, this is a roll call vote. Elder Lefebvre. Eight eyes. All right, that's approved. Next 41, RC number 652425 by the Licensing Hearing and Public Safety Committee, to whom was referred resolution number 42425 by Elder Persons Rust and Lefebvre, 
authorizing the creation of a temporary designated outdoor refreshment area during the 2024 Mercury Racing Midwest Challenge, August 9th through 11th. Alder Rust. I move to receive the RC and adopt the resolution. Second. Moved and seconded. Discussion on this item. Seeing none, roll call vote. Eight eyes. That's approved. 40, 42 RC number 66, 24, 25 by the licensing hearing and public safety committee to whom was referred direct referral resolution number 47, 24, 25 by older persons Rustin Lefebvre authorizing the fire chief to execute an agreement with the city of Manitowoc Fire Department allowing the city to borrow an ambulance to help as reserve for the Mercury Racing Midwest Challenge Powerboat Race event. August 8th through the 12th. Alder Rust. I move to receive the RC and adopt the resolution. Second. Moved and seconded. Discussion on this item. Seeing none, roll call vote. Eight eyes. All right, that's approved. 43 RC number 702425 by the licensing hearing and public safety committee to whom was referred to direct referral general ordinance 142425 by older persons Rust and Lefebvre amending section 48322 of the Sheboygan Municipal Code to remove, remove the mandatory neighbor approval for street festivals and special event permits. Alder Rust. I move to receive the RC and adopt the substitute ordinance. Moved and seconded. Discussion on this item. Seeing none, roll call vote. Seven eyes, one no. All right, that is approved. Okay, we approved item 44. Item 45, general ordinances. General ordinance number 1524. 25 by older persons Russ Perella and Peterson amending section 14308 and 14309 of the Sheboygan Municipal Code as to allow food trailers to be food trucks. That will be sent to the LHPS committee. Matters laid over RC number 312425 by the Plan Commission to whom was referred general ordinance number 102425 by older persons Ballinger amending sections of the Sheboygan Municipal Code as to correct various errors identified in the current zoning code. Alder Bellinger. I move to adopt the ordinance. Second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion on this item? Seeing none, this is a roll call vote. Eight ayes. All right, that's approved. Alder Decker, we've exhausted the agenda. What's the pleasure of your motion? I move to adjourn. Second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. We're adjourned at 7.52. Good night.